Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 1. Uh, looking, uh, as we continue on, uh, generally moving in a certain direction, uh, we find uh, probably the ultimate preacher, I shouldn't say probably because he is the ultimate preacher, and him giving of the message of the day for the exact moment in time. Mark 1, starting with verse 21. The Word of God says, and then they went to uh, Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, Father, I just want to thank you, I want to... Praise your holy, sweet name. Father, right now, as we come before you, I just simply ask that you would be high and lifted up. And as you were high and lifted up, that you would shine a beam down on our lives. Lord, those places in our lives where we are not where we need to be in you. Father, I just simply ask that you would draw us to you. That you would draw us to that altar. And that those things can be killed on that altar. That we might live a life completely and utterly in your authority. For it's your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. Now as we look here, uh, they were amazed that because he taught with authority. So what does that mean? Uh, well, he, he, Mark and Peter give a good contrast. The scribes were probably uh, some of these ones that they uh, they were like this the whole time and they weren't really sure if they should say this or they should say that. No, we find Christ simply getting up there and speaking boldly, teaching uh, taught boldly. Now, when you look at the word taught there, it means to instruct, of course. So, uh, we find what is Christ doing? The same thing that he, that he's done all throughout the time where he will, he will reference scripture and then he'll give exactly what's going on or a good explanation of what's going on in the scripture. And then we find that then he would apply it. You find that all through, uh, the Beatitudes. We remember uh, for uh, blessed are those who mourn. Well, he is referencing uh, over in Psalms and the mourning that we do as, as children of God and they will be comforted and so forth. He's going over and over and he's got authority. Now, the thing about it is, in this authority that we got to understand, uh, you can tell when there are people that, that really are not sure about what they're talking about, right? You ever met any of those people? Where they think they know everything, but really they know nothing. And, you know, in some cases, all of us have been there. Uh, maybe where we have been put on the spot and we're like, up, 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 up. But, you know, that can happen too. But we find Christ getting up there with supreme authority and he preaching, teaching, applying the Word of God to the people in the church house. Now, I could go if I wanted to and be a little bit on the fundamental side and say, well, guess where he was when it was church time? He was in church. Guess what that should tell us as a very good representation that when it's time to be in the house of God, be in the house of God. But we find on as we continue, uh, and there we find this authority. They ask this question about what they're astonished at his teaching. He taught us having one with authority. Now, how does Christ have this authority? Now, we all know the rest of the story. We know He is the Son of God. So, therefore, He has the authority because He is the Son of God. Yes, we know that. But at this point, He's coming in. Uh, he is uh, basically a brand new preacher before all these people at Capernaum. He's been, his whole life pretty much has been living in the backwoods of Nazareth with the rednecks and the roughnecks up there next to the Sea of Galilee. Now he's came down and he is starting to preach and all of a sudden they have him come in and we find this authority is in the, his authority comes in the power of the word of God. Look there again, verse 21 and 22. And there they went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue or their church and he taught. Now when you look at that, you understand, if you go over, I think it's, um, 
Matthew 3, and I know it's a Mark 4. Uh, Mark 4 is virtually the exact same story, or uh, Luke 4 is virtually the same story. Uh, but you look and you'll find that what he would do is they would come in and they have in the in Judaism, they have a scripture for the day. And therefore, they would open up the, sc- the scroll and they would read a certain section and they didn't do it by touching the scroll. They would actually have themselves a, a big long pen and they would touch the words as they read them with the pen because they felt that the Word of God was not even worthy for human hands to touch. Now, now you think about that. And all this same thing, we got to remember who is Jesus. He is the Word of God. But we find here His authority is in the very power of the Word of God. Now, when we look at that, what we need to understand is that we look at it when we come to the Word of God, we must understand that we must come it comes with amazement. This book is really 66 books written by over 40 different authors over a 1,500 year period over a cross of three different continents. But yet we find that it's really written by one who is God himself. We find in that that because of that we must approach him, we must approach his word with awe. We must approach the spoken word, the written word with awe. As we look and we must be awestruck in amazement of what God has done and because of what God has done in our lives, we can then see what He can do in our lives. If He did it once, He can do it again. If He took you out of the bondage of sin once and you find yourself back in there, guess what He can do again? He can take you out. How many times have we been uh, like, oh, uh, Paul? Now, we think of Paul as that superman, uh, super Christian, and, and we look at all the things Paul did. But let me tell you, if you read his writings, you'll find he struggled with sin just like you and me. He still had to struggle day in and day out. But I'm so thankful that he said, who can take me out of this bondage, this baggage, this stuff of sin? I thank my God, Christ Jesus. When we look at the authority of God, we must understand that the authority of God goes through Scripture. It goes through the very Word of God. That one, that if you remember in John chapter 1, I believe it's around verse 5, and the Word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. That's the same one. That's the one that we must have all of. Therefore, when we read our Bibles, it's not just to read it flippantly. It's not just to uh, read it for just for words. It's not just to Uh, just to say that I've done it. No, it's to study, to show ourselves approved, because what we do is we go before His throne every single time with amazement. We find with that in this, this word, amazement means also, uh, that not only were they in awe, but they were in fear. Now, if everything in this book is true, now I'm going to tell you, I believe it, from cover to cover, there should be some godly fear in our lives. There should be some fear that comes in our lives. Why? Because if He said it, He's going to do it. I must go away. That when, I, when it's time, guess what? I'm going to come back again. I want to receive you unto myself. You see, that that's a promise that we have. That's a promise that, that we should have in fear because why? Uh, we never know when that time's going to be. You don't know when it can be. I remember, I guess it's been about 10 years ago now, uh, uh, it happened up there where we were preaching at, pastoring at. A uh, man was in the pulpit preaching his heart out uh, before uh, before the, uh, the house of God. And guess what happened while he was up there preaching? He had a heart attack and died behind the pulpit. We don't know. So when we go before the Lord in His Word, we must come in awe and fear. 
That fear then leads us to reverence. We should reverence the Word of God. That, that means we don't treat it, treat it flippantly. Oh yeah, I know God said not to have any other gods before me, but this is something I want to do and He's going to understand. No. I know I'm not supposed to steal, but you know what? I want this. I don't have the money for this. I'm going to do it anyway. No. I'm sick and tired of seeing people say, well, God will understand. If it says it is wrong in this book, guess what? It is wrong. If it says it's right, guess what? It is right. If it doesn't say anything about it, guess what? There's some liberty there. But we find that the authority of Christ comes through His Word with amazement. Now, now as we look at that, we understand what that then means. If, if we come before Him and we come before His Word and we look to Him, then we have something that we've got to do. We've got to make a choice. Now, you might not like to make choices. You may not like to make decisions. But I tell you right now, all of us made some decisions this morning. When your eyes popped open, you had the choice. Are you getting up or are you laying in bed? How many people do we know they laid in bed a little longer? Even though they had an extra hour of sleep, right? You got a choice. Are you going to get up? What are you going to eat? If your brother Kenneth, that means you're going to have raisin bran. If your brother John, you probably won't have chicken. But the choices we're talking about when it comes to the authority of Christ, the first choice we got to decide is the same question uh, that Joshua, who, uh, whose name in the Greek is Jesus, by the way, had told the people, choose you this day whom you shall serve. You see, when we wake up every morning, when we look at the Word of God every single day, we must choose who we will serve. And how do you know who you choose? By the way you act. By the way you are. By your mannerisms. You see, we can see who we serve by how we serve. And all God's people said, oh me. It's not, it, it is important of who we serve, because if we don't serve Christ, then we're going to hell. But it also matters of how we serve. Do we serve by simply opening up our lips and, and saying things, or do we roll up the shirt sleeves and get down in the nitty gritty and do what needs to be done? Anybody can give lip service. But it's true service that matters. Now before you say I'm heretical, I'm going to go over to James. And in James, James says, You say you have faith, but you have no works. I show you my faith by my works. The authority of God in Scripture tells us that Christ must be Lord of our life. That's who we serve. How we serve is dictated by the Word of God. Christ did not come and die on the cross and raise again on the third day uh, so that you could be a Sunday morning Christian and the rest of the, day, the time you live as a pagan like the rest of the heathen do. But unfortunately, too many times that's what happens. Who we serve is a choice. How we serve matters. When we serve is critical. In what ways are you serving Christ? In what ways is His authority 
top in your life. You want to know that by how you do it, but when you do it. Do you do it only when it's easy or do you do it when it's hard? There was a song that, uh, that when my father was dying of cancer, every day when I would leave from being at his side, I would put it on and I would, I would cry the whole way home. And the song is, I will praise you in the storm. See, it's easy sometimes to let him have authority when things are good. But how about when it's tough? Does he still have authority? See, it's authority of his word. It's authority, and we, we know this, the power of his word is when it brings it to submission. Now, if you'll look in, uh, in Christ's life so far in the book of Mark, we know a few things. He submitted to baptism. Did he need to be baptized? But what did he do? He did it anyway. Why did he do it? To identify with you. He submitted by being in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights without food. How many of us could do that? Not any of us, right? I was talking to a, a brother the other day uh, that did a seven-day fast. Seven days, he ate nothing. He said, day one, day two, that wasn't too hard. I said, well, it would be for me because I'm diabetic. He said, I know. By day four and day five, you hurt. Now imagine 40 days of submitting to the power of God. Because of that, we find uh, that then the authority came. How do you know that? Because then we find he begins to preach uh, the gospel. He began because authority in Christ comes through submission. Submission as we let things die on the altar. We don't like that. I bet you if we went in every single one of our houses, come springtime, and there's some things that uh, one spouse or the other are going to want to get rid of because it's spring cleaning, right? Who are my spring cleaners in here? What's the other one do? Well, I might use that sometime. Have you used it in the last three years? Well, no. Get rid of it. Amen? But we're the same way when it comes to sacrificing things on the altar of God. Maybe it's because we think that we can control it. Control's an illusion. Maybe uh, we're too partial to it and we don't want to see it die. Things die. But what is it in your life right now that maybe needs to be sacrificed on the altar? You know exactly what it is. It already popped in your mind. But why don't you do it? Why don't you bring it before the altar of God and say, Lord, here it is. See, it's in that submission that we submit to the power of God in His Word. It's in that submission that we find that's how we got salvation. You remember where you were? I remember where I was. I was, stand, I was uh, sitting on a, uh, basically a pew about two back from Brother Tim back there. Listening about how God sent His Son to die on the cross for me. Come to that point where there was a there was a point, a tipping point, that I had to make a decision. Do you remember that decision you made that day? Now you may say, "Well, there have been times I failed Him." Everybody in this room has failed Him. you know what? 
we still had to submit. Where in your life maybe do you need to submit to Him today? Where is it that you've got to say, Lord, I've been struggling with this for so long and there's nothing more that I can do. And if you could hear the audible voice of God, you would then hear Him say, exactly, why did it take you so long? Because when we submit, we come to find that we are surrendering to Him. Surrendering to the Lord. How do you need to surrender today? Preacher, I'm afraid that if I go to the front that, that, that they're going to, somebody's going to think bad of me. Number one, who cares what anybody else thinks? Number two, when will you surrender? If not now, when? See, it's the power of the Word. Look on verses 23 and 24. You'll find that it's the power that liberates us from bondage. Now, there was a man in the synagogue... Uh, So, whoa, whoa, the man is in the church house uh, with an unclean spirit. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him uh, saying, be quiet. Literally, if you look in the Greek, it literally, that it's not that nice. He says, shut up. And come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, and he cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. So what do we find there? We find that the, the, the authority of God is through the power of the word, but the authority of God is also in the power to liberate you from bondage. Now, this bondage, we need to understand, that it said a unclean spirit. Now, uh, when you look at, at uh, Brother Mark and how he wrote down what, oh, uh, uh, Peter had said, what we find is that Brother Mark wrote it this way, and I would assume this is the way that Peter saw it. It, it means to be possessed by an unclean spirit. Or to be possessed by the devil. You see, you are either one of two things. You are either uh, possessed by Christ or you're possessed by the devil. You see, we know that because this evil lordship that, that this devil had over him, he still made it to church. But yet he still had this unclean spirit ruling his life. But when we're possessed by Christ, people will know by our service. They'll know by our worship. You ever been in a church and don't raise your hand if you do? Don't tell me the name of the church if you know if you if you, this is you. But I can tell you I've been in a few over the years where you go into the house of God and you preach or you sing or whatever and there's no spirit at all. You ever been there? When when you walked out, did you want to write down on the top of the door, Ichabod? You see, sometimes we allow Satan to be Lord of our lives instead of having Christ be Lord of our lives. And it shows, not only in our life, but in our families, in our job, in our churches, in our activities. All of it shows all of the time. Now, when we look at that, we find that this this unclean spirit, uh, he was enraged. He was mad. Guess what happens when God gets on the scene and somebody is not following Christ? They're going to get mad you see that Christ 
has the power to liberate us from bondage. You see, he, he can and He will abolish the strongholds of sin in your life. He can and He will abolish the strongholds of rage. He'll abolish the strongholds that have so much shackled you that you don't know what to do. He can liberate that. And as he does that, we'll find uh, that he will relieve you of the misery that you are in right now. The misery of having no hope. You realize there's people outside these doors right now and maybe somebody in this room that really have no hope and right now inside they are miserable. Do you know what can take them out of that misery? The authority of God. Think of an old song. Uh, maybe you know it. Why it can wash away my sins. You can take care of the misery you can take care of the misery of being deceived. There are plenty of people out there that, that have been so deceived that they think they're doing right, but really they're not. But honestly, this misery comes through rebellion. He was enraged. You look there, if you look... You don't, you don't catch it off the top of your head. You've got to look back over to John to understand what this demon inside of him is doing. He said, what, have you to, uh, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Now that may not mean anything to you. You're just going to read that and go on. Unless you read John chapter 1. What did Nathaniel say when they said Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth, what good can ever come from there? This devil, this demon was even trying to attack Christ. But in the same breath, he said who he was. He was the Holy One of God. Though he was in rebellion, he still knew the truth. What misery are you going through right now? What stronghold has you? That all you need to be is relieved of that burden. As he relieves us from the misery, what he does is he redeems the soul. He'll redeem us from the disdain and the apathy that we have in our lives. He'll relieve us, He'll redeem us of the destruction that's going on inside. Of the despair inside. If you look at this demon in this man, he did give A testimony of who Christ was, didn't he? He's Jesus of Nazareth. Well, technically, yes, he's Jesus. He was born and raised in Nazareth. Check. He is the Holy One of God. Check. But did that power, before he was liberated, reign in his life? What I'm going with that is how many times do we have hollow professions? We know who Jesus is. We can see what he's done. But it never hits here, does it? I continually go back to Psalm 2 when it says, Why does the heathen rage? 
Why do we act out in rebellion instead of being redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb? See, the authority in Christ is in His Word. The authority in Christ is in His liberation. The authority of Christ is simply in the Gospel. Look at verse 27, 28, and we're about to be done. And then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves. There's that word amazing, same word. What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority... He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. This new doctrine is the gospel. The world understands the do's and the don'ts. They have their own list. But the gospel liberates, the gospel redeems, the gospel comes with amazement, and with it, the gospel delivers. Write it down, and you can look at it later. It'll be a little bit of homework. Romans 6, uh, verses 15 through 23. I'm not going to read them now, but you can later. And you'll find there that he delivers us from the slavery of sin. He delivers us to slavery in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. No longer are we who we used to be, but we're a new man, we're a new creature. He delivers us to the holiness and eternal life in Christ our Lord. Last week in Sunday school we were talking... Uh, we're still looking at we were looking at eschatology again, uh, one of my favorite topics. But anyway, uh, and uh, the comment was made: you're going to live forever in one of two places. How many times do we forget that? The power of the gospel will deliver us unto a holiness in eternal life. The power of the gospel will edify us to confirm in us what is right. As it abides and as it perfects. We'll read real quick. I'm going to go over to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews chapter 6, looking at two verses, and then we will be done. Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2. There it says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Well, what are those? who He is, and how to get saved. Let us go into perfection. The gospel will complete you. Outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there will always be an empty gulf that you cannot fill. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. What does that mean? That means we're already saved. From the dead, uh, from dead works of faith toward God. That means we can do things even though we're dead. What Paul tells us. Of the doctrine of baptisms, laying of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. See, this perfection that happens through the power of the gospel, it completes us. Before we did things just because we were supposed to. We were expected to. But now we do them out of the love that he has for us. And in that, you and I can and should live by the grace of God. heard something this last week, and it, I, I've heard it all my life, but it really it struck home with me again this week. We can never err when we side on the side of grace. 
Right now, you are struggling. Right now, there is something that you are not letting God be Lord over. But will you put that on the altar and just simply say, Lord, I'm giving it to you, and I'm seeking your grace. Can you do that? Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come before you right now. Lord, I just seek your face. Father, right now there are people in this room that are definitely struggling. And they don't even know why. Father, right now I just simply ask to you in your still, small voice. Speak to them. Father, they know that you are to have authority in their lives. They know that you are supposed to be supreme. But quite frankly, you're not. Father, give them a new love for your word. Let them feel the redemption that's there. Let them look at this new doctrine of grace and gospel that is right there just for them to to grab, to cherish, to be changed. For it's your name I ask and humbly pray. Amen.